This podcast is a production of Open Pediatrics, a free online resource for health professionals' education. Visit openpediatrics.org for more. Hello and welcome to the Open Pediatrics World Shared Practice Forum podcast. I'm Tracy Walbrink, a pediatric intensivist at Boston Children's Hospital and co-director of Open Pediatrics. In honor of SIDS Awareness Month, I'm grateful to be joined today by Dr. Rick Goldstein, a palliative care pediatrician, associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, and the director of Robert's program on sudden unexplained death in pediatrics. Dr. Goldstein has recently published a perspectives piece in the May 2022 edition of the New England Journal of Medicine entitled Only Halfway There with Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Welcome, Dr. Goldstein. Very happy to be here. Well, I was wondering if we could start out a little bit with terminology. There are a lot of terms that are used for death that occurs suddenly in infants and children, mostly during sleep. And I was hoping that you could walk us through these terminologies and how they are related to each other. Yeah, so it's a surprisingly complicated question to answer. There was a time that there was no, no such thing as SIDS. And these deaths were called crib death or cot death or overlying deaths. And in the 60s, in 1967, in Seattle, there was an international congress and the question for the Congress was, is there anything distinct about a little blip in mortality? They knew that there are different manners of reporting this phenomenon. They knew that this phenomenon was extraordinarily constant wherever you looked, throughout the developed world at least. But there was no real medical take on it. There were just scattered findings by pathologists. And the question of the Congress was, is there a distinct entity that we should start to look at, that medical science should start to consider? And so they spent a year looking at epidemiology, looking at prevailing theories, and they concluded that, yes, there's this odd thing. Most people attribute these deaths to positioning or to overlying on the part of the parents. But in fact, when you look at the statistics, when you look at the epidemiology, it wasn't the most vulnerable babies that were afflicted. There's a relative sparing of infants between birth and one month. And then there's this really extraordinary rise in mortality that by about six months is 90% finished. And then there's a tail phenomenon. And they decided to call that thing SIDS. And that was the beginning of research on the sudden infant death syndrome. That research led to some epidemiology that found that sleep position had something to do with this. And that was the beginnings of back to sleep. And in the early 90s, people found that if you just changed the position where you placed babies, your risk for SIDS, at least as it was understood, really went down. And SIDS rates went down by half. Coincident with that, people started to say, well, then what is this thing? Maybe I don't like the idea of this vague concept of vulnerability, and maybe these are accidental suffocation deaths. Or maybe I don't want to label this with a syndrome, and I'm just going to call them undetermined deaths. And so on a local level, and this is true throughout the world, people started to make decisions, people being medical examiners who are filling out death certificates, made personal decisions or office-wide decisions about what to call these deaths. And part of the drop of SIDS was that there was what we call diagnostic shift. So the SIDS rates really have not changed very much throughout the world since about 1996. But pure SIDS rate using a diagnostic code has continued to come down. And that diagnostic shift is its own problem for surveillance. So the solution among some is to group this all together. And that's what SUID is, or SUDI is. In Europe, they call it SUDI. That's sudden, unexpected on this side of the Atlantic, unexplained on the other side of the Atlantic, death in infancy. And there's a song and dance about what we're really talking about when we are doing our research and when we're labeling a case of an infant death as a SIDS death. So we actually had, uh, it was in 2018, we convened another international congress to come up with some consensus on what to call these deaths. And 
the findings of that Congress, the, what we call the Radcliffe Congress, are being considered by the World Health Organization as a modification for IDC-11. And so the consensus definition right now is to say unexplained sudden death in infancy or sudden infant death syndrome is the sudden unexpected death of an apparently healthy infant under one year of age that remains unexplained after a thorough case investigation, including performance of a complete autopsy with ancillary testing, examination of the death scene, and review of the clinical history. So it's a very complicated answer. When you do basic science research, it forces you to re-adjudicate every case. Because, for instance, in Germany, it's all SIDS. In New Zealand, it's all suffocation. It's like 85% of suet is suffocation. And that's just local takes on how to manage things. In the United States, it's about 40% SIDS, 30 plus percent undetermined, and the remainder is what we call ASSB, accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed, which is an ICD code. Wow. Well, it's quite complicated, but thank you for that explanation. I'm wondering, for those of us that work in emergency departments or intensive care units, we see these children not uncommonly. And I was wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about how common is this and what are we seeing you know, around the world? So look, it's the leading cause of death in any developed economy for an infant between one month of age and one year of age. That was true before back to sleep. It's still true now. The country in, in the world that purports to have the lowest rates of sewage, so I know I'm going to group it all together, is the Netherlands. And even before back to sleep, in fact, they figured out back to sleep in major part because of the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, historically, babies were slept in the supine position. And in the 80s, they wanted to be like the United States and bring their babies prone. Dr. Spock was saying to bring your babies prone, so they did. And their sit rate went up, and they went back to the traditional ways, and it went down. It's A, there are plenty of reasons why we think that their rate might be lower, but their rate has always been lower, and it's 19 per 100,000. The rate in the United States for sewage is 93 per 100,000, and there are certain groups that are really at higher risk. So American Indian Alaska Natives are over 200 per 100,000, so think about that. That's 0.2%. It's almost that for non-Hispanic black population. We know from slave records, because those were tracked investments, so we know from slave records that even during the times of slavery, that African-American infants had a higher rate of SIDS than what was understood to be the established rate in the, in the communities where they were found. But I also want to point out that so remember, the Netherlands has a rate of 19 per 100,000. The Hispanic rate is 55 per 100,000. So all those sociodemographic poverty trackers seem to be a little bit more complicated than you might think at first go. And non-Hispanic Asian families have a rate of 22 per 100,000. So that competes with the best country reports in the world. It also points out something that's very interesting, I think, which is that when you look at Asian Pacific Islanders, many of them in their natural cultural settings co-sleep. And they have among the lowest reported rates in the world. So the prevalence factors point to other issues that implicate medicine and implicate biology beyond just simple external factors. So it sounds like it's probably a very complicated etiology for all of these patients as you lump them together. And I'm curious, you know, you mentioned different populations, different ethnic groups. If you could walk us through, what are some of the proposed mechanisms? Are they genetic? Are they syndromic? What are risk factors or some of the proposed mechanisms for death in these infants? Uh, I want to answer another question first, because in some ways, in general pediatrics, I don't think among people that look at this problem in particular, but in general pediatrics, there's a little bit of a disagreement. And the disagreement is this. 
are these normal kids who either are in sleepy risk environments or get themselves into a hazardous sleep position and die, so are they normal kids, or are these kids who have what we call intrinsic vulnerabilities? And our work looking for these mechanisms is to accept the fact that whatever the mechanisms involved, the rates for SIDS went down, although there are some details about how to make sense of how it went down, but that it went down with attention to external factors, but it's still the leading cause of death in the world. And almost always, when you move beyond the epidemiology and you look at the level of an individual patient, you start to find things. And out of our group at Harvard, there have been three major contributions that I think are important mechanisms. Let me just qualify it. There is this phenomenon that when you discover a cause for SIDS, it's not SIDS anymore. So let me just tell you two examples of that. One is MCAD, medium chain acylcholoid deficiency. That used to be SIDS. Now it's an early detected disease treated with diet and attention, and it's not SIDS. Or if they die, they die from MCAD. That affected the SIDS rate. Long QT syndrome. These babies are detected in utero. The families at risk are detected earlier. There are treatments to avert death. If they do die, they die from long QT syndrome and not SIDS. So that's a little bit of it. Our interest is in further understanding the vulnerable infant. And important work began here and was done by Hannah Kinney in neuropathology. And it was based on two different sets of findings. So in the early 90s with Back to Sleep, in the hospitals, we started to monitor babies, many more babies, and we found a couple of things. Number one is when those babies died, first of all, we, we learned what happens when babies die from suffocation. They get tachycardic, they start to flail, they, there are all these rescue mechanisms that come into place. We also learned about that apneic pause, right? You have hypoxia, I'm talking to a critical care person, you have this apneic pause, and then you have autoresuscitation. The babies who died on monitors in the hospitals or at home didn't do that. They had what we call uncoupling of their autoresuscitation. And so what you found was that with a hypoxic challenge, there is an apneic pause, and then the rescue gasps that you start to see would occur in a normal baby, those are usually accompanied by arousal. The baby starts to turn their head, arch, yawn, whatever it does to free the obstruction and to increase tidal volume so that more oxygen comes in. And at the same time, there's a cardiac response and your heart rate comes up and those babies auto-resuscitate and they recover. With relatively modest threats, the babies that died on monitors had an uncoupling of that. They had all the brainstem-derived respiratory responses. They had the gasps, and they had little hypopnic followings of gasping and increased respiratory effort, but their heart rate never responded, and they just stayed asleep. They died quietly, even though they were, if we're thinking about whether these are normal kids, even though they just suffocated. Well, there's something really kind of odd about that. And that became a question for Hannah, like, how can that be? So she was smart enough to think about the centers of the brainstem that really control autoresuscitation. And she measured every neurotransmitter that she could think of. And what she found was about 40% in her studies, and she went through five different data sets, independent data sets, those kids had a deficiency of serotonin, serotonin precursors, serotonin receptors. There was some derangement of serotonin there. And that's the serotonin uh, hypothesis for SIDS. And it's age dependent. The risk is age dependent. And you can create mouse models where you knock down the serotonin, either acutely with an injection or through breeding with, of a pet one knockout mouse. You expose that mouse to hypoxia, and they do exactly what those babies did on the monitors who died. That's the tidiest, most elegantly studied aspect of SIDS. One of the issues that 
we have as a medical field is all that science, all that explanation occurred, and then that's the end. There aren't medical examiner systems that are interested in further pursuing just how many of these kids end up with it. We haven't really figured out how to do appropriate assays in the hospital. The assays done for the research required flash freezing of, of the brain stem within 24 hours. So that, although it is embraced and talked about all over the place, is kind of stalled research because in medicine, you don't really care about research if it doesn't lead to anything more. But that's mechanism one. Mechanism two had to do with a study that we did here. We were collaborating with a group in Canada because we learned about serotonin and we were interested in SSRIs. Somewhere you know, in Boston, I think between 20 and 30% of pregnant mothers are on antidepressants. And we were wondering whether it affected their serotonin. We never really figured that out. But we looked really closely at the brains of those babies to see what was going on. Serotonin is a trophic factor when it comes to brain development. And the first case that we looked at in this series was also on the same day that we looked at the first case in Robert's program. That first case, when we looked in the temporal lobe, we saw something that was unusual. And Hannah, being as extraordinary as she is, she understood what it was right away. So in the 90s, there was this neuropathologist named Hauser, and she looked at temporal lobe epilepsy. They were just starting to do lobectomies for people with resistant epilepsy, and she found that in the hippocampus, there's this tiny little gyrus called the dentate gyrus. It's sort of a switching station for cardiorespiratory control, among other things. And she found that the granule cells that make up that swirl that we call the dentate gyrus did two things in temporal lobe epilepsy. They dispersed, so instead of it being a nice packed, discrete anatomic layer, they dispersed. And in more severe cases, they bilaminated. So first case with the serotonin, the SSRI study, there it is. Oh my gosh, you know, lights going off. Everybody said, well, we'll just have to see what this is. But we're pretty excited about that. But just through chance, the same day, we looked at our first Roberts program case. And the mother of that infant was better than the books, better than the textbooks. This was a mother who not only did she not take SSRI, she didn't drink caffeine, she didn't drink alcohol, she didn't anything. She lived the clean, great life. Not that there's anything wrong with people that don't do that, but she had none of those exposure risk factors and her baby had bilamination. And so the question is, for us went from, is it serotonin that's doing this to is this a marker for SIDS? And so Hannah went to California. California has, is the only state in the country that has a law that says you can do ethically approved research on babies who go through medical examiner systems. All these babies have to be, you know, you call the medical examiners. They have to get an autopsy there. You can do research on them without parental consent. We don't quite operate the same way, but they have a huge tissue library. And the fact that we could go to a medical examiner's office that covers a whole region made this more of a population-based look rather than just a convenient sample. And when she did that, and she went with this other neuropathologist whose name's Donna Armstrong, who is considered the dean of temporal lobe research and pediatrics, and they found that 40% of the babies that they looked at who had SIDS had bilamination or dispersion. They also found that even in this condition called SUDC, sudden unexplained death in childhood, not as good of a cohort, but similar percentages. So that's something that we called epilepsy in situ. And we don't entirely understand what the mechanism is. We think either there's an intrinsic vulnerability that causes a sort of failure of autoresuscitation when stressed, or it may be that it's a first time seizure that's not recoverable. One other little chapter that also gets into the next mechanism that I'm gonna talk about is 
So then we looked at the first 10 cases in Robert's program that we did our genetics for that had this bilamination. And two of them had a deleterious variant in a gene called SCN1A, sodium channel gene called SCN1A, which is implicated in living kids in Dravet syndrome, which also has an elevated risk of SUDEP, sudden unexplained death and epilepsy, and then a febrile seizure syndrome that is similarly associated with sudden death. So in just that like tiny little bit of research, A, people weren't really thinking about genetic mechanisms or didn't really have genetic mechanisms beyond long QT syndrome. And secondly, it really opened up attention to the brain. Third area is genetics. And our approach in Robert's program is not simply genetics. To our mind, the importance of any work we do with genetics has to lead to a better way of identifying who these kids are and whether they're important subsets. Because let's face it, this is a miserable phenotype. A baby dies during sleep with or without certain risk factors in their environment. That's like one of the worst phenotypes we have in medicine, even if it is a major cause of mortality. So the first thing that we've done is we've really tried to understand phenotype. And phenotype has to do with neuropathology. It has to do with general pathology. It has to do with family histories. We're finding very complicated family histories that once we identify the variant in the baby, we now can explain. So we modeled this on something that the Undiagnosed Disease Network does, a sort of precision medicine view. We do a chart biopsy, we do medical history, we look really strongly into the family history, we do certain aspects of the autopsy, and we create phenotypes, and we have phenotypic buckets. And then we compare that to genetics. And our genetics have different tiers of analysis. But one thing that we've done over the, it's now been 12 years, is we've settled on, it's almost 300 genes now, that we think any baby who dies from SIDS should be checked for. So that's the first thing we do. We do a, a genetic evaluation of the trio because we are interested in de novo mutations. And de novo mutations, that's like a juice factor. It, it brings up the likelihood if it's a gene that does something important that's evolutionarily conserved and it's associated with diseases and it's de novo, all of a sudden we have higher risk. And then we look at the world library of known diseases, known Mendelian diseases, where we can evaluate these variants. And that work we published about a year ago in the last year in genetics and medicine. And if I could interrupt you for just one second. Yeah. You mentioned trios, and I wonder for our listeners if you could just explain what you mean by that as you're thinking about genetics. Yes. There's a, f a kind of famous study published in JAMA looking at the genetics of drugs, pharmacogenetics. And what they did was they identified using fairly stringent criteria just using the proband, the person that they were interested in, and ignoring any phenotypic information. And they found like an enormous number of people that by all rights, they should be really sick or there should be something really wrong with them. But then they looked into the broader families and they found like, well, actually nobody in this family is sick. Here's the mother of this person and lived to 97 and never had any problems. And so we've learned to understand so we have certain kind of criteria that we can use to evaluate genes. Is this a gene that's really important? Is it evolutionarily conserved? Is it there in frogs and lizards and Drosophila and in humans? Because that probably means it does something important. So is it conserved? Where in the gene is the, the variant? Where, in the, where is the mutation? You don't care if it's on the last base pair, right? but there are certain things that cause loss of function. Our criteria is, does it alter the protein or its function in a way that's either shown through disease associations or in silico predictions? And then it has to be really rare, because since it's a really rare disease, 
none of these kids survive. They leave the genetic pool. So we don't expect that we're going to find things that are floating around everywhere. And so de novo is kind of a great candidate for that. So that's one of the issues for looking at the trio. So that's a parent ch child triad. The other issue is that this is kind of a black hole for parents. The, their children are investigated. They're investigated. They rarely hear what the investigation concluded. If the conclusion is SIDS or sudden unexpected death, what does that tell them? But on the other hand, they know that the three generation risk is almost nine times higher in that family after SIDS to have another SIDS. And this is in the back to sleep area. And they are four times higher than, the, than they were before this happened of having it happen again. So part of our efforts are to really be able to sit down and we can never reduce risk, but we try to stratify how we understand their risk. So I can say to them things like, here are the ones that we check on everybody. Your family doesn't have any of those. That doesn't take your risk back to what happened before, but it ought to be reassuring. Your family, uh, we saw that your child had a, an ex, uh, a number of de novo mutations. They were in genes that really raised no concerns to us. We don't think that that was a mechanism. Your aunt had epilepsy and drowned. You know, here's what we think of that variant. Your child had it. We don't think it had a role, or we do think it had a role. And you can see that already we're talking about something very different than a normal baby who just happened to get into a sleep accident. So that's why the trio is so important. We were interested in two levels of analysis. One is, on a population level, mm -mm. is there something different about these kids? We've talked about this idea of vulnerability. And we asked that question in two ways. And the first way was, do they have more de novo mutations than our reference populations. Our reference population for this was an autism genetics study that controls from that. So unaffected kids. And as we measured the risk in our population for de novo, deleterious de novo mutations compared to those controls, it was more than twice as high. Now, our study was really on just a few hundred kids. So I don't know that the twice issue is the important one, but what was important was that the p-value was to 10 to the negative seventh. So the idea that these are different by chance is pretty small. And then we similarly looked at our go-to genes, and we found that in comparison to controls, and these controls were children's hospital controls that, you know, we just sort of accumulate these controls when kids come into the hospital. And again, we found for the genes, for deleterious variants on our gene list, the risk was twice as high, and the p-value to that went to, to the, the negative 14th. So clearly, there's something different about these kids. There's a, there's a pretty sturdy argument to be made about genetic differences. And then when we got down to the case level, to the individual, 11% of the time, we could associate the cause of death with a known variant in a gene, either previously reported in a disease that's plausibly related to death, or without much finagling, you, you would expand the known phenotype to include that. And those fell into three basic categories. So one were the cardiac genes, cardiac genes being cardiac arrhythmia genes and cardiomyopathy genes. The second are what we call neurologic genes. These are either brain malformation genes or epilepsy-associated genes. And then the third group are syndromic, or we call them systemic syndromic conditions. And these are syndromes where there might be sporadic reports of early death. There might be brain malformations. There might be funny metabolic derangements that are associated with it, where we felt pretty strongly about that. But just because it's such a different way of thinking about this. We used as stringent criteria as we could, and those were the 11%. And within the paper, you can see the case histories. Number one, you see things that are 
not necessarily picked up on during standard procedures of autopsy, but you also can find family history uh, information that just confirms things. So what's 11%? You know, the, the truth of the matter is the Broad Institute, across all their disease categories, that's their rate of discovery is around 11%. If you look at the undiagnosed disease network, so these are living patients, can be called back, can be reevaluated, they can do physiologic testing. They're making a diagnosis about 27% of the time. So obviously we, we would like to get our f foot in the door, but I think it's a, it's a pretty credible move in the right direction. So now I'm gonna tell you another story. I'm gonna tell you about aging research. So there's this one theory that aging and death from getting old and the conditions that are associated with getting old have to do with a lifelong accumulation of mutations, of variants. And that's work that's been done in aging. It's also been done here at Children's with um, Chris Walsh's group who looked at accumulation of mutations and onset of Alzheimer's disease. But there's something really odd when you look at those curves because you see that when babies are born, they, they don't have zero. They actually have quite a few, and it takes about five years for them to reach the nadir, and then aging begins, that accumulation begins. So what's going on here? And some of that might be disease-associated genes that we understand, but what it likely is, is disease that nobody's looked for. And SIDS is a condition that goes into medical examiner's offices. If they check for genetics, they're really just checking for, you know, sudden death panels, which are known diseases that no one really looks across the whole exome, and no one really thinks about this as a fertile area for disease discovery. And that's really the direction that we're going. So for instance, we have a bunch of genes where, boy, every way that you'd think about what this gene's purpose is and the pro you know, how this protein works and where this variant is in the gene just says this is a bad player, but there's no disease association. So now we're starting to do things like to crisp them into zebrafish, or we're, we're starting to collaborate with different groups to find animal models so that we can potentially discover diseases. And getting back to this idea of SIDS, it's this kind of like waste bucket. Well, actually, it's not a waste bucket. It's just a, a lot of things that we have. It, there, it's just really a lot of work to do. I don't know that that's, I, I'm not saying that suffocation never plays a role. It certainly does play a role. But I think that there's a sizable part of this that's just undiagnosed diseases and undiscovered diseases. It's incredibly fascinating in the work that you and your group are doing to identify these causes so that in the future, maybe there are treatments, maybe there can be modifications that could be made or early detection, I think, is in, incredibly exciting. I'm curious for those that aren't as fortunate as me to have you and your colleagues here, are there any ways that people at other institutions or other countries can be helping to contribute to this growing body of knowledge and discovery? Yeah. Well, there are other groups that do it. Iowa has a group that's very interested in this. Seattle Children's has a collaboration with Microsoft. They're doing sort of big data looks at this. Uh, NYU has a really credible group that's made important contributions. There's a group in Australia that does stuff. The French are just getting into this. So there are options are around the world. We originally started this as just a Massachusetts program, and we stopped. So I would say, you know, maybe 20% of our cases are from Massachusetts or New England, and the rest really come from around the world. So. We're a referral center and we'll bring anyone in or we'll, we'll help them find people that are doing this sort of work. We're kind of on the frontiers, you know, like I think people have different approaches. I, I really believe in our, in, our, in our approach and I don't take credit for it. I think I work with incredibly talented and s smart people who actually can call themselves geneticists or epileptologists than geneticists. So what I like about our group is that we come together around a horrendous problem and everybody has their say and it's really led to what I think is a really good way of thinking about the case. So to answer your question, we're open to anyone. 
And I'm also happy to talk to any clinician or any family who just wants to know about local resources. Wonderful. Thank you. That sounds like an incredible resource for people. Yeah. Kind of relatedly, you know, a lot of these conditions that you're mentioning, you're sort of on the early frontier of the diagnosis of these conditions, and there's no treatment at present for most of these. How do you approach that with the family, you know, when you're sitting down and talking about what you found, and how do you begin to explain that, and especially when there's not options to modify that for future babies or, you know, other family members, other families outside? It's a thing. I mean, just to put yourself in the position of the parent, what are they wishing for? Do they want me to find something? <laughs> if I do, uh, sometimes we can do something about it. Uh, honestly, sometimes we can. We don't really talk about it because we don't really know how to contextualize how much of an expectation that should be, but sometimes we do. But sometimes we don't find anything and that's good, but that's not good because we haven't made the uncertainty and the pain of living with all this worry. You know, people have studied parenting after their babies die from SIDS. It's some work that we do. We do prolonged grief disorder related work as well because we think it's a very complicated experience that informs a lot of pediatric mortality to understand what parents do with this. To me, one of the most powerful studies came out of Australia, a nurse named Jane Warland, and she described something called paradoxical parenting in these parents. And by paradoxical, she meant that these parents hover, and they do. If they have another kid, can you imagine putting your baby to sleep or allowing yourself to go to sleep? So they hover, they're super physically connected, and yet the grief experience affects their attachment in ways that you can measure. And their style of attachment is a little bit more cautious. Not that these kids are pushed aside at all, but when you take a fine view at all the different elements that go into parenting behavior and attachment, you see that it's altered, it's a little bit more cautious, and it's a little bit bracing for something bad to happen. And that's something that I kind of have to talk to these parents about. Your question, however, was about disclosure in these kinds of circumstances. I feel like there are three parts to this, right? So let's talk about the cases where we really don't find anything. That's most of the time. I can have a conversation about what the risk is going forward because once you introduce the idea of genetics into the cause of death, incompletely understood genetics into the cause of death, there's this phenomenon where Parents wonder if they're just a bad combination. It's a ter think about that, that it's a bad combination. Like if the two of us have another child, it's going to, bad things are going to happen. And that's something that I've learned that I have to, to deal with. And so part of a negative, a return of negative or no conclusive findings is to help them thinking, think about elevated risk, which... Are, which I can't get a bit them back to their background, but I can remove the risk. I can say that we've checked for every disease that we could possibly check for, and we didn't find anything. Sometimes there's a follow-up question when they talk about bad combinations. I can answer particular concerns about everything that's going on in their side of the family or something that happened during the pregnancy. That's, I think, helpful so long as I don't delude myself into thinking I'm the cure for their pain because knowledge is not going to cure their pain. And even if we have a full explanation, it's, you know, the people that have been hit by lightning, there's no argument for them being worried. It, you know, you can't reassure people when these very rare events occur to them. And so I just kind of name it and we talk about it. There's certain things that we can identify and we can see it's, traces in the family tree. And usually that does come with a referral, often to a cardiologist who might do stress testing on a parent, or we might make a referral to the child. We have a, a cardiac genetics uh, group here that focuses on sudden death. And I think what they get is a different kind of assessment of the living risk, you know, and I think that that's helpful. But the hardest part uh, I don't, I still don't know if we have it right. And the hardest part is, yeah, we found something, 
yeah, we're pretty sure that it's a bad thing. There's nothing that we can really do about it. And what I offer parents for that is, but let's make sure that we do everything that we can do that just is sensible. I just have one final question for you. I wonder, you know, given your many years of experience as a palliative care pediatrician and speaking with these families, I wonder if you have any tips or insights or practical advice that you could offer for those of us that are talking with these families when they first come in through the emergency department or ICU, anything that you found that can be really helpful in those situations or anything that maybe we should think about avoiding and as we discuss and, and talk with the families. Yeah. I mean, it's such an important moment for just humanity. And they're crushed. They are just crushed. They're blaming themselves so much. It's important to be frank. I think it's important to think about what they're going through. Their homes are investigated. Sometimes people are making a decision while the parents are, are at the bedside waiting to hear what the CT shows. Someone is making a decision about whether their other children need to be removed from the homes. They are running through their heads. The parents are running through their minds all the different things that maybe they should have said something about, maybe they should have known. I think going into a room with that kind of an awareness, not a feeling that you're going to solve things or you're going to make them feel like you, know, you have it under control. This is not a situation to have anything under control. I think just kind of being with them would be really powerful. One, I think, really unfortunate thing that people do all the time is if they hear that the baby was prone or was found prone, they'll be like, oh, well, of course. And number one, I don't know that, that, that our understanding of this problem even supports that view. But number two, just think of what you're doing to somebody at that sort of a moment. So I think that kind of circumspection is really important. By the way, I should point out, so there's this great study where they looked at babies found prone, babies found supine, and they measured their serotonin. And same numbers of kids had deficient serotonin in the prone group as in the supine group. There's just a lot that's not fully understood, but there's a lot of connections that we really haven't drawn yet. I think it's a moment for compassion. I can tell you that the the longer term grief and the experience of learning to carry your, your child forward when you feel accused and suspected is very complicated. And there's plenty of time for those things to be sorted out. So I, I, I would just encourage people to do your best to approach the situation with humanity. Thank you. I think that's Really incredible, you know, as you think about these families and all of the competing things that are going through in their mind and what they're dealing with, as you said, being as human as possible and treating these families as if it was you, I think is so essential. And so I thank you for highlighting that. Yeah. I want to just add one thing because there is an, an increased risk in poor families. And, you know, when a baby dies, that's the child of a 16 year old who doesn't have a dresser but has like plastic bags filled with food uh, with uh, clothes in their grandmothers and the baby dies on their bed. It's such a complicated assumption to make that that somehow is that mother's fault. <laughs> and that's sometimes is the case, right? There's an easier family to be compassionate with and a less easy family to be compassionate with. And sometimes it has to do with how similar they are to us. But Sometimes it has to do with just what we associate with poverty, with what we associate with race. And I think in this kind of a really cruel, cruel event, we have to be even more mindful than usual about those sorts of assumptions and attitudes when we go into the room. Yeah. I mean, we're all humans. Grief is grief. It's horrible, yeah. no matter what your situation is. And to be respectful of that in every circumstance, I think, is essential. Yeah. Well, I wanted to thank you so much for all of sharing all of your wisdom and insights. Um, this has been an absolutely incredible conversation. I feel like I've learned so much and the historical perspective as well as 
these emerging glimmers of hope that we may be able to find something that we can treat and sort of act upon, I think are really exciting. And just wanted to thank you so much for your work, especially your advocacy work, and getting this awareness out there and encouraging people to take a deeper dive and not just stop with a standard autopsy, but how can we continue to investigate the cause? Just want to say thank you for all your yeah, work well, that you've done you over the years. Thank you for your in it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. This has been a production of Open Pediatrics. Check out the description box to view the resources and journal articles referenced in this podcast. To hear more podcasts like this one, log on to openpediatrics.org.